<laughs> yeah, they had abundant of, abundance of. Here we go. Welcome everybody to the Voice Project, a town hall, a different perspective, part two. Um, the promise of America is a great one, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. It takes hard work, sacrifice, and accountability. And we have not always lived up to that promise for some. Today, we will walk a mile in someone's shoes as we discuss a different perspective, part two. Today, our panel consists of Susan Hudson, the president of the National Association for Civilian Oversight of Law Enforcement. She'll be joining us shortly. Uh, Harriet Walden, Mothers for Police Accountability. Alexis Hornbuckle of the WNBA uh, played for the Detroit Shock. As I said, she is a class of one. Um, the only female athlete ever to win NCAA and WNBA championships. Uh, Felicia Camo, I haven't seen her on yet, but hopefully she'll be joining us soon. And Sean Barnes of the Chicago uh, Police Oversight and formerly of uh, the North Carolina Police Department. Life Aid Voice Project is a national nonpartisan effort to effect lasting social change by bringing together great team players from the veterans and sports communities with community leaders to build bridges to improve the health and safety of the communities where we live. We seek to improve the health and safety of our communities by organizing activities to build understanding that lead to positive action. And we will accomplish this by bringing together our veterans, first responders, sports figures, and people from the faith community, the school community, and the law enforcement community. Please understand we're here to listen, learn, and provide positive solutions and outcomes, find common ground, understanding of our differences. We do not need to agree on everything, but we need to find respect for each other on a basic human level. Um, this is a respectful, positive dialogue, and uh, we have our guidelines. The session will go until 4 o'clock. All audience members, please mute yourself now, except for the panel, unless called upon by the moderator. All speakers are asked to keep their remarks to one minute. Uh, this will allow for the most interactive and questions to be addressed. If you have a question or you have a comment, please type your questions and comments into the chat box. As you know, I get to as many of them as possible. Uh, no political statements. We don't care who you voted for. Um, this is a positive, respectful dialogue on how to improve our communities by being more kind, more civil to those we don't know, don't look like, and don't agree with. And if for some reason you can't follow the guidelines, um, we have a we have a easy button, easy easy exit. <laughs> Uh, we never had to use it, thank goodness. But uh, anyways, um, and with that, um, my phone's blowing up, but uh, let me put it on silent here because people like to text me. Uh, I'm going to start off uh, by introducing Alexis, uh, Alexis Hornbuckle, um, and uh, we'll have her uh, say a few words, but just know that she played several seasons in the WNBA, and she's the only player like I said, to win titles. And actually, she won the titles in the same year. Is that correct? Do I hear that right? You, you, won, the, you won the NCAA title, became a pro, and won a title again? Uh, correct. God, yeah, that's, God, was, the same year. God was blessing you. Uh, she played Man. for the University of Tennessee, which we all know, if you follow basketball at all, is the women's powerhouse of all powerhouses. And with that, I'll introduce Alexis. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, I'm actually honored to be here today and have this opportunity to speak about, you know, just police community relations and also just how to help better our communities. Uh, yes, sports or basketball is what I did. I'm fully retired now, I'm six years in the WNBA and 11 overseas. Now what I do is I work with uh, girls youth basketball. Um, basically, we get grades third through 11th grade on teams, we mentor these girls, we teach them how to do interviews, you know, the little things that carry you on through life, not just on the court. So um, when I got, when I received this message, um, I, I happily joined in and I'm grateful to be a part of this. This will actually be my first experience with uh, like a virtual town hall. So, you know, I'm, I'm a little nervous, but I appreciate y'all having me. 
Um, one big thing that I would like to say, especially being in sports, is as y'all see this year, this current year, athletes have been using their voices, you know, whether that's sitting out of games, putting names on shirts, um, being advocates, uh, even sitting out of seasons just to advocate for change and social justice. And for me, that's big because since, you know, before when I was coming up and going through the league, that really wasn't an option. It was more almost the the quote unquote shut up and dribble role where you didn't get too heavy into, you know, the politics or helping out the community. It wasn't a team or organizational thing. It was more so you would have to do that on your own. Um, but now to see, you know, the, the military, the police force, and people within the community all trying to work together to better things, I think is is extremely important for future growth of our nation and for us to really come together. Um, I'm a real advocate of like police community relationships and kind of how to how to build that bridge so that you know people feel trusted, people feel at ease when it comes to law enforcement and not fear. Um, because I know I myself, I live in Mooresville, North Carolina, which is primarily, you know, rich, white uh, city, but, you know, just 20 minutes one way or the other, it's you looking at poverty and different things. So how do we get everyone to feel comfortable? And I think a, a lot of that is just, number one, acknowledging and discussing uh, with, the com with other people what you're facing within the community. Don't be afraid to speak up. I mean, things can't change if they're unknown. So you definitely got to speak up if you're being harassed or bad things are happening. But even if good things are happening, speak up so that there's not one stigma going on where all police are bad because we all know that that is not true. Um, also being transparent and accountable, you know, not only holding yourself accountable to work with, you know, police officers when there might be a crime or something happen when they come through the communities to question uh, about certain situations. Um, don't feel like, you know, oh, I can't say anything. I don't want to snitch type thing. Um, but that's really important for you to be able to communicate with law enforcement. Also, the young ones being able to do so, but also the law enforcement being able to properly communicate with people in that community and listen and hold themselves, their selves accountable for their actions as well. Um, I just got a couple other other points that I wrote down that's big for me, and that's taking steps to reduce the bias and improve cultural competency. Um, basically, that to me, it comes down to more training on all levels, you know, whether whether you're a rookie or a senior officer, just really getting involved um, within your departments on, you know, diversity, implicit bias, uh, cultural competency, just so that people learn because everybody reacts different. Everybody's culture is different. They move different. And what you may see as noncompliant may just be a misunderstanding of culture. So and vice versa. So understanding those things are very important as well. Maintaining focus and um, the importance of working together and collaborating together and being visible in the community, community, not just doing things, you know, virtually or, or nobody knows about it. Let people see, you know, community leaders and police officers working together to better the community. And I think that will help us take a step forward. Um, and lastly, just promoting like internal diversity within the workforce with on the police force uh, within the communities, you know, in these town hall seats and, and things like that. I think that will also help bridge that that cultural differences and the, those misunderstandings that are happening a lot due to pretty much miscommunication or lack of education. So, I mean, that's pretty much what I wanted to to speak on because those issues are real important to me. Thank you, Alexis. That's awesome. And um, one shameless plug. Um, the Life Aid Virtual Auction for Hope is live now. Uh, Renata has posted the link in the, uh, in the chat box. You can donate and bid on items, including we have such fabulous items. Uh, Putty from Seinfeld will have a 30-minute um, virtual meeting with you and tell you stories from Seinfeld. Um, he's also been on our town hall. Uh, Nick Searcy, who was in that manhunt, Eric Rudolph, that you're probably all uh, binge watching on Netflix. Uh, he's donated a 30 minute session. He's actually from North Carolina and a huge college basketball fan. Um, we have golf things. General Casey, improve your golf game. Mer Meredith Kirk will give you a free lesson. Um, and we have a whole bunch of items, something for everybody. Y'all got to go Christmas shopping. So uh, have at it. And, uh, 
you know, bit early, bit often. Um, so thank you for that. And uh, our next guest that I want to introduce, I uh, believe he is on. Yes, is Don Samuels. Uh, Don Samuels is the former city councilman for the city of Minneapolis. Minneapolis was ground zero uh, in uh, May when George Floyd was killed by uh, the Minneapolis PD. And so um, they had a series of actions, including voting to defund the police, among other things. And so, um, Don, I'm going to let you uh, take it away. Yeah, hi everyone, I'm Don Samuels, former council member in Minneapolis, former school board member. And uh, now I uh, run an organization called uh, Microgrants. We make small grants to low-income people starting a business or a career. Grants at about $1,500 and, um, and uh, up to uh, about $3,000. And those grants can buy a car to get somewhere to get to work or to get your business going or to um, for education or for a, a new business you're starting or growing. And uh, we give out a million dollars in 2020. Uh, in addition to that, we have a lights on program where after Philando got killed, um, we, we, d we started this program giving uh, vouchers to police departments uh, they drive around with them in the squads. When they pull someone over for a broken light, instead of a ticket or a lecture, they give them a voucher to get it repaired at the local, uh, several local uh, auto repair shops, absolutely free, up to $250. And we, uh, we have 100 uh, police departments, police sheriffs, departments and, and state patrol in Minneapolis and, and Minnesota. And we cover 82% of the state of Minnesota. And we are now in Wichita and uh, starting in Socrates, New York. And we're talking to Orlando and Fort Lauderdale and Cincinnati and Nashville and a bunch of other cities to expand this program. Everybody loves it because it's a win for the police department. You got a hero police officers walking up. You can only deliver so many babies a year, but you can give out vouchers every day. And uh, so they give uh, numerous, numerous opportunities each cop gets to do a great thing. People come on Facebook and, and celebrate their vouchers. They, they want to take uh, selfies with the cops. Uh, it's a really popular program. And, and then it's great for this for the uh, service providers because they get their cars repaired free there, and so they love the service providers. And many people uh, switch their service providers after getting their lights replaced. And uh, there, we have 100% satisfaction with the service providers and 98% satisfaction with the police interaction. Very successful program. It's a win-win-win, and it's privately funded. I raise all the money, and um, and we will. Um, this program is growing rapidly. Yeah, we're gonna we're gonna uh, shine some light. You see, uh, all, uh, Tom and all the guys are writing notes right now about what a great idea this is. Um, yeah, it's everybody loves it, <laughs> and you know, police departments they 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 look at us like, what's the catch? There is no catch. This is uh, absolutely free. We, we partner with the police departments and they pay half of the, uh, the cost of it through their own fundraising. We pay the other half. And um, so that's, that's the Lights On program. You can check it out online. So, so General Casey, you and I can talk about this offline with the, some of the relationships that we're building and how that could be uh, supported. In, in the community yeah, and of in the fact, NFL and, and, and NHL and all that, WNBA. That's right. Mm -hmm. And in fact, the Vikings are just came on board funding Lights On program in, in uh, Minnesota. And uh, so we're looking forward to partnering with other teams across the country. That's terrific. Yeah. Um, and, uh, of course, you know, we, we are the hotspot of uh, 
police community controversy and um, we have a very, very um, uh, left uh, city council, younger people who were galvanized by the protest movement and the, the very, very well organized and now well funded um, groups that grew out of this who um, crowdfunding during the uh, crisis right after George Floyd, it, incredible amounts of money came in, uh, $35 million uh, to two organizations. And so they're well funded. They mounted a very aggressive campaign to um, and had large crowds. And you saw that resulting in a, a powder, powder horn park announcement on CNN where they uh, had defund the police um, uh, in almost life-size letters across this podium and nine city council members out of 13 uh, declaring their intent to defund the police and and that was what they would need to um, to uh, surpass the mayor's veto power uh, o over the, the months as the regular citizens panicked and saw that uh, as crime spiked because of partly because of that announcement. A lot of the young people in our community saw that as an uh, uh, opportunity to commit crimes with slow, very slow response times or no response because the police force was so depleted by PTSD um, uh, claims and early resignations, over f about 50 resignations because of the incident. and. Um, the aftermath and then the PTSD claims that we're down 160 plus cops out of 880. So yeah, that's a lot less cops. And so the crime rate just spiked. We had uh, 80 homicides in a city where we had, you know, maybe 40 last year or and we had 500 shootings, which is the highest in the cities in the city's city history. And um, I hear gunshots every night, several times. And um, so every morning it's news on who got shot. And so you, and the, a lot of carjackings, I think 125 carjackings so far, which is a first, <laughs> they never happened before. And, and the average age for the carjackers is about 14 or 15, down to all age 11 or 12. That's bizarre. And so there are a lot of accidents with these kids crashing the cars. One, one crash killed three kids. One of them was decapitated. So it's, it's pretty nasty what's going on, you can imagine. And so for the city council to hold fast on its intent to defund, and uh, even though it's the major, the, the a weak mayor system, um, the mayor did have oversight of the police department and other emergency services but they wanted to wrest that away from him by the budget process. And so over this budgeting process, they attempted to um, reduce the police budget um, that would only permit 750 cops, and um, which again would be a, a, a hundred and about 30 or 40 reduction from the, what our, what this, uh, the numbers were this time last year and, um, and to limit, put the cap on that and uh, to force the chief to come every year or to come back next year to ask permission to get funding for two recruit classes and for overtime. So basically they were using the budget process to wrest control of the police department from the mayor and to curtail the numbers and the powers of the chief and the troops and um, so the community kind of really came together. I myself spent a lot of time on Facebook um, trying to get people motivated to call uh, the city council members and register their opinions. And eventually we got, went from a nine to a four uh, a pre disposition to a seven to six in favor of the police. And of course, our language was both and. We don't condone what happened to uh, George Floyd. Uh, we don't condone cops like 
Chauvin in the department. We want uh, uh, social services and others to complement uh, police work, but we will also want enough police to keep us safe. And so um, the council on the other hand felt that if we have enough social services and if we have enough um, uh, uh, other kinds of uh, uh, supports um, that we would not need police and they could see a day when there was absolutely no police, which is so unrealistic and naive. But um, so it, you can imagine how scared we were and how acrimonious the battle got. But in the end, we got them to lift the cap on the amount of police um, and also to uh, um, to keep the funding for the police. But they there was compromise in keeping those increased funds in a special budget, um, in a, a special reserve, so that the chief has to come and ask for it next year. But they can't put that money anywhere else but in police. Um, so, uh, so that's that's basically yeah a victory. No, that's good. I mean, we're going to get into that in more detail here in a minute. I want to try to get to the to the other guests. Um, our, our our next guest is also new to our family, so we want to welcome her with open arms. Harriet Walden is the founder and president of Mothers for Police Accountability. Um, and uh, Harriet, if you could uh, say a few words about you and your organization and how it got to be, and uh, we're, we're very pleased to have you. You just have to hit the red button to unmute. All right, how's that? Can you hear me now? We can. All right, thank you. I got some situation working on here. Um, well, I'm, we've been doing this for 30 years. I, my kids got beat up by the police uh, in 1990. Uh, we were called Mothers Against Police Harassment then. Uh, and I, over time, we changed our name to Mothers for Police Accountability because we want accountability for everyone, not only the police, but for everybody. Everybody should be accountable, and that's why we changed our name for Police Accountability. I. I, it's uh, been tumultuous here in Seattle. Uh, lots and lots of things have gone on, a lot of demonstrations, and uh, I'm, I'm, the whole world has heard about the CHOP. Uh, and that uh, I'm on, I am part of the Community Police Commission. Uh, you know, the DOJ Seattle is on the consent decree. Uh, and so uh, a lot of the things that people want so far has still has to be signed off by, by the judge. Uh, they did not defund the police here uh, as people had wanted about 50%. That didn't happen. I think only about 22% police officers have left. Uh, uh, I've heard some have come back. Uh, and a lot of the uh, changes that people wanted to give a lot of the um, a lot of the police work like, uh, you know, the community, I mean, the CIT crisis intervention what I actually got started because of our work uh, be back in 19, uh, 1996, 97, the police uh, had killed the elderly man. And, uh, and prior to that, another elderly man had been killed. And so what we wanted to do was set up something that was, um, uh, that was humane and get people trained. And so we went to Portland and adopted the Portland model there and was crisis intervention. At that time, it was all volunteer. But when the uh, when the um, DOJ came to town, uh, what they did do um, is that they memorialized uh, uh, the crisis intervention. So that was part of uh, that was part of the consent decree. So people want to take that out of uh, you know take those calls away and uh, you know want to redo that. Well, that have still has to be signed off by the judge. Uh, and some of the things, other things that people want to do to give by uh, to take away some of the, some of the powers and, and some of the calls that, that uh, and set up social service. I mean, there's a group here called uh, uh, King County Equity Now, all African-American-led. Uh, they were able to uh, get uh, some money for this year, and they could do, I think, approximately $3 million to help work on some of the goals that they have. But as it stands right now, uh, 911 is still uh, uh, under the police department. I mean, because a lot of these jobs have to be bargained. You just can't go in and take jobs away without bargaining. And so people kind of think that this is going to be uh, immediately, but uh, it's uh, it's not there yet. And like I say, uh, uh, a lot of this, uh, we've been on the consent decree ever since uh, 2012. Uh, and, um, and it looks like we might get some police accountability in the state level here. I mean, there's a lots of bills going through to be able to, to uh, uh, decertify police officers so they can't go from one county to another one uh, uh, after it's a bad shooting or, or some of those kinds of things. 
also uh, the governor just announced yesterday that they want to set up a, a agency to do all to investigate all police shootings in the state of Washington I mean so we might get some real police accountability uh, uh, in the state of Washington uh, we might get some we might get some some uh, uh, some police accountability a, a different way uh, if it, anything's happened in the state level well, then that's going to be good because it's for the whole state of Washington uh, so um, anyway I uh, we're still at the table, and um, we did give back a twenty-five thousand dollars grant from Black Lives Matter because, I, uh, as of May twenty-fourth, they were not doing any work in Seattle, uh, uh, and so we just decided to just to stay on our own path and uh, keep doing the work that we were doing because the fact that Black Lives Matter uh, uh, is uh, because we also want to highlight all the mothers who died. I mean, the children have died. I mean, Mr. Samuels uh, uh, brought up the crime there uh, 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 in in your city there. Uh, this escalated and that's the same thing here um, and until we can do both and uh, we, uh, until we can be as concerned about police shootings uh, as, as we can be uh, concerned about all the mothers who are crying because their kids uh, their children have been killed by the police and will not be having will not have Christmas dinner uh, and, and then I, I think that we'd be well on the road to be in healing our community because we have to do both and and so uh, recently we've been well, we've been doing both and in a lot, a lot of ways because I have another organization that we've been doing the uh, working with, uh, with uh, breaking the silence on black on black violence and how we harm one another because that's an inside job. You can't get, but this is something that we have to do ourselves. I mean, this is this is strictly something that African Americans have to step up to and to do it. I grew up in segregation and the violence was not there then. So, anyway, um, that's basically uh, what we're doing right now. And like I said, we're staying at the table and. Um, uh, and continuing to do the work, and we were not part of the defund uh, uh, because uh, defund cry because we know operations. And uh, if you've been doing this work a long time, you know operations. You know how many. You know you need sufficient officers for public safety. Uh, and the officers do a lot more than what people think they do. I mean, as well checks. I mean, it's just a whole way of things that the public cannot do. I mean, even if even on the domestic violence call, they want to give those out to uh, uh, to a community. Uh, uh, nonprofits, but well, uh, community nonprofits would not know uh, uh, if there's a, a, a restraining order. It's some things you just can't take from the police department to give to the community because those are things that come with law enforcement and and uh, and and those kinds of things. So, I uh, and again, by us not being at that, uh, we we just took the middle path. We understand operations. We understand that uh, if you have. 800,000 people in almost 800,000 people in, 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 in a city like Seattle. It is no way that you can lay off officers or get rid of officers to have public safety. Uh, because I think for us, mothers is concerned about, you know, not only when black people call the police, but what happens in other communities. Everybody ought to be able to call and be able to get a, a certain amount of care and uh, when, when necessary. And uh, also we need police officers who absolutely understand constitutional policing and understand that I uh, that it's also uh, it's not necessary to always shoot people uh, that there are many ways to de-escalate and so we want officers to be trained to be able to be dis de uh, de-escalated but uh, truly uh, we're not uh, abolitionists and we're not trying to actually destroy the police department because over time uh, it took us 30 years to get the black officers here actually our, our black chief that we uh, was able to uh, bring forward I uh, did uh, retire but it took 30 years to get diversity on the police force. And uh, you just don't throw that away and walk away from that. I think if that's about it. I don't think I'll take any more, uh, many, any more time. Uh, but we do have a website uh, that people want some more information about mothers. And like I say, it's been a generation of doing this work. I've grown, uh, I've grown up now. <laughs> that's awesome. Uh, thank, thank, you. Th th thank you. Thank you, Harriet. And, and, and as you guys all know, the voice project is, uh, I mean, they, they articulate it as both and, and we articulate it as you can be patriotic and love your country and love your community and also want better policing. And uh, they're right. not mutually exclusive. And, uh, That's right. and with that, I'm gonna, we got two more uh, real quick speakers. Um, I wanna bring on Sean Barnes, another newcomer to the program. Uh, he comes from North Carolina and then now he's in Chicago and he works in police oversight and uh, he works with uh, David Versa and the Will uh, Initiative and, and some of that work. So go take it away, Sean. And he also, um, Susan is buddies with Tarek, our, our friend from Arlington, Texas. 
Take it away, Sean. Thank you very much. Um, so I started my law enforcement career uh, 20 years ago uh, in Greensboro, North Carolina. I came to law enforcement from teaching. I was a public school teacher. I taught school for four years, um, having a degree in history, uh, secondary education. Um, I got into policing really, I believe, for the right reasons. Um, I, I really like people. I like the idea that you can do something different every day. And I developed uh, a style of policing, which was I spoke to people as if I already knew them. And for some reason, it just puts people at ease and they smile and they're trying to figure out how they know you and you can really solve their problems. Um, while in Greensboro, I was fortunate to have good mentors who taught me the right way to actually police a community. They taught me that you can't parent a community. You can only police them. And if you're policing a community, you're serving them. And I thoroughly enjoyed uh, my time in, in Greensboro. I did a little bit of everything, most notably uh, being a hostage negotiator uh, for 10 years of my career. It was one of the highlights of, of my career, just helping people uh, in distress. Uh, I am a veteran, United States Marine Corps. And so just, you know, just that one call of, of talking uh, a seaman from, from killing himself or committing suicide, you know, if I didn't do anything else in my career, that was good enough. Um, but I, I did rise through the ranks uh, to the rank of captain, where I was asked to do really a plethora of things. But one of the things that really um, point, uh, jumps out is that I was asked to go to our training division. And I was asked to retrain or reformulate our training division so that our officers understand emotional intelligence, so that our officers understand procedural justice, so that our officers understand implicit bias. And so I reduced the number of hours we spent learning how to fight. I reduced the number of hours we spent learning how to drive fast because we all know <laughs> what happens, you know, cops want to drive fast and we know that sometimes that can be dangerous to everyone involved. But I was really proud of that effort and what I was able to do and being involved in the community, getting calls from students and community members at two in the morning uh, because they trusted me enough to say, hey, there's a police officer at my door, what should I do? Um, in 2017, um, I got a call from um, a police chief in Salisbury, North Carolina, which is just north of where Alexis is in Mooresville. And they had had an officer, uh, officers who had conducted a no-knock search warrant. And they had shot and killed a 20-year-old uh, black male who um, was asleep um, reportedly asleep at the time. And obviously the community was upset. They asked me to come down and help them uh, develop a strategy for putting their community back together. Um, and in doing so, they offered me a position. In fact, they, they made a position for me as their deputy chief. And I was able to work side by side with my chief to do what I really like to do, which is reconciliation, healing, putting communities back together which really is just an extension of what I learned in, uh, as a hostage negotiator. And so I spent that time, uh, my first year in Salisbury, doing things like changing policy, getting rid of no-knock search warrants, except, except when there is um, um, uh, use of deadly force is required, doing things like making sure that every officer understood foot patrols. And before I ask them to do foot patrols, please understand that myself and the command staff, we walked every zone in Salisbury before we asked the officers to do so. Because you have to lead this initiative from the front. I really, really believe that. And so we had meetings. Some of those meetings, um, you will know, uh, can be contentious. Um, I, will, I will tell you a quick story is that one time we were going to a meeting with a group of concerned citizens. Um, I forgot what they called themselves, but they were not happy with us. And my boss looked at me and says, I'm not going. He said, you can go if you want to, but I'm sitting this one out. And I said, well, chief, you know, we got to know how to take a hit. And so I went and um, I heard everything they had to say and um, I took it, but they respected me. They respected the fact that I was willing to listen and I was willing to put forth their 
opinions in action. I, I had a saying in Greensboro, no one leaves a community meeting without homework. If I have to do something, you have to do something. So if you want me to look at a policy, I need you to bring your neighbor with you to the next community meeting, pre-COVID, obviously. Uh, and so what that does is it creates partnerships. If we are business partners and I'm doing all the work, uh, that's, that's, that's not going to happen. We're not partners then. And so we engaged the community in this process. They were happy that we reduced our no-knock search warrant. They were happy that we were doing foot patrols. They were happy that we were willing to listen and make ourselves vulnerable because in the end, it is not our police department. Let me say that again. It is not our police department. It is the community's police department. And police chiefs who forget that, they don't last long. They just don't. And so I was able to be successful uh, because, of, because of that. And then George Floyd happened. And just like putting money in a bank, after George Floyd happened, that money was gone. And we had to start all over again. We had protests. We had uh, a Confederate statute uh, called Fame that sat in the middle of downtown that people wanted gone. We negotiated with the owners of that uh, statue, the Daughters of Confederacy, and it was moved. And, and it really meant a lot to the community that we actually took the time to listen. And we're the police department. We can't tell them what to do. But that doesn't mean we, doesn't, we do not have a voice. What it showed the community is that as police officers, we are part of that. And let me be 100% clear, if I wasn't a police officer, I would have been at that protest as much, period, point blank. And so I couldn't do that, but I had to do something. And we had been floating this idea, some of you know Tarek from one of the other community meetings, but me, Tarek, and Obed Magni, who's out in Sacramento, California, Tarts and Arts, and we have been floating this idea for a long time. It was time to do it. We have all aborted planes, and we went to Selma, Alabama, and we spent the entire day at Brown AME Chapel with uh, Pastor uh, Theoda Strong, and we sat and we looked through the archives, and we talked with him about social justice, and we learned about Jimmy Lee Jackson, someone who, who most People who are protesting don't even know who this person is, but he was a 26-year-old deacon in the AME Zion Church, which is almost unheard of at that young age, and a veteran who was killed protecting his family by Alabama state troopers uh, in 1965. His death sparked the revolution uh, of marching from Selma to Montgomery. We spent the entire day learning about social justice, something that I've always known about, I grew up in the rural South. No one has to tell me about segregation. No one has to tell me uh, uh, what, what segregated society. I grew up in community housing, community authority, the projects, whatever you want to call it. I know. But I learned something valuable by spending time with him. The next day, myself, Tart, and Obed, we got up early and we proceeded to walk from Selma to Montgomery, 54 miles to the Montgomery State Capitol. And it was a, an experience that I will cherish for the rest of my life because along that walk, we probably walked about 15 miles a day. People stopped to offer us food, water, both white, black, male, female, gay, straight, you name it. I got an opportunity to experience what America really is if you take the time to learn about it. And we had people uh, who stopped. We walked in the rain, in the heat. Uh, wild dogs chasing us, you name it. Um, and so we learned a lot about each other, a lot about ourselves. And when we turned onto the main street and we could see the Alabama state capitol, tears started flowing from my face. And I looked at Tart and he was done. I looked at Obed and he was smiling. He's from California, so he smiles constantly. Uh, Sacramento, so uh, yeah, he smiles constantly. But Tarek and I were, were, were bawling out, and I went on Facebook Live to just let out what I felt was in my heart, and that is we must have reconciliation and we must have healing. There's been a lot that's done to community, has been done to communities, and the police have really um, taken the brunt of that. And too many things have been placed on police officers' shoulders to fix problems that, quite frankly, uh, 
it didn't happen. That did not happen because of them. Um, I'm reading two books now, and, and if anyone likes to read, uh, the first book is called The Color of Law. The book details how housing discrimination um, has been one of the sole causes of wealth uh, inequality in communities of color. These were um, policies and procedures from our government that um, did not uh, help communities of color um, achieve wealth, and it's a very good book. The second book that I'm reading is called How to Be Anti-Racist. And so when I talk to police chiefs and I hear them say, well, sure, there are racist cops, but my police department isn't racist. Well, that bothers me because your police department should not be non-racist. Your police department should be anti-racist. And if we're gonna move to the next phase in policing, please understand that communities want police departments that are anti-racist. What does that mean, Sean? It means that we want police departments who have policies that clearly state that we're not gonna to respond to a suspicious call when the only information we got is, it's a guy that I've never seen before walking in my neighborhood. We're not gonna to respond to calls for it's mental health and hey, somebody's not acting right. He may have a mental illness, which means that he's dangerous. People with mental illness are more likely to be victims than they are of assailants. So we have to make sure that as police chiefs, we have policies that demonstrate to our communities that we are anti-racist, not non-racist. It is not okay anymore to say that we're non-racist. That's not going to cut it. We must be intentional in everything that we do if there is going to be reconciliation. When we turn that corner and I saw that Alabama state capitol and tears start to flow and I start to think about the things that my family have gone through, my, my grandmother who, who, you know, worked at a cotton gym, picking cotton with her hands. I think about all of those things that, um, that I went through to get to where I am now, you know, being told that um, I wasn't college material, I have a PhD, uh, being told that, I, I'm, you know, you're from the projects, what are you gonna be? You know, those type things, we can overcome them if there's some type of reconciliation. And so we must begin that process. And I think reforms like this, we will. And lastly, I'll just leave you with this. Before we left, um, Alabama, Montgomery, we had an opportunity to go by the Equal Justice Initiative. Um, and most of you know who Brian Stevenson is, but Brian Stevenson talks a lot about reconciliation. He was the subject for the movie Just Mercy, the, um, the actual attorney. He says there's four things that you have to do, and I leave this um, with everyone. I didn't come up with it. I just agree with it. The first thing is that there has to be some type of reconciliation. You cannot move forward if you don't recognize that there is a problem and that you want to be a part of that solution. The second thing is that you have to be comfortable with being uncomfortable. I heard police departments and cities all across America talk about being progressive, but no one can define it. Being progressive means I am comfortable being uncomfortable. I don't mind going to a church and worshiping with someone that's not in my religion or having dinner with someone who doesn't speak English. Uh, the, the second thing or the third thing uh, that he talks about is that you have to be willing to change. And the fourth thing, most importantly, is that you have to do it with a hopeful attitude and a hopeful mind that change can occur. Those are the four things that, you know, he talks about and I apply them to my personal leadership philosophy. And I, I, I really sincerely thank you for the opportunity to have me uh, come on and, and just be with a great group and I'm willing to sit back and listen and kind of learn from, from everybody here. And Alexis, I hope things are going well down in Morrisville and Lake Norman, uh, it's a beautiful area. So uh, thank you so much for having me. Thank, thanks, Sean. And there's, there's a lot to unpack with all you said. Um, and we're gonna, we're gonna get to that in just a minute, but I wanted, I, Coach Lev has to, uh, has to leave us and I wanted to, um, uh, introduce him to the whole group. I was hoping to introduce him to Harriet, but I definitely want to introduce him to you, Don, um, before he has to go. And uh, he works in Colorado Springs, and we did a retreat with him, and we hosted a live town hall. It was our first live town hall, and and he's starting a program for with using boxing with police and kids in in his community. And the, there's 
we're gonna we're gonna work with you uh, on trying to do that tail light program. I, I think that's an ingenious way to create goodwill, and it's so simple. But Coach Lev, I just wanted to to make sure you got all those connections before you had to go. And if you want to say anything about the program that you're putting together. Well, thanks a lot, John. And again, I feel honored to be part of this town hall. Uh, it gives me goosebumps to sit and, and listen to everybody's story and just the magnitude of what everybody's doing to bring a better understanding about our, our world, I guess, our states, the United States. Uh, and with that being said, that the POWER program, which has been around for years, it's the Police Athletic League, the acronym is PAL. Uh, I've been out here in Colorado. I did most of my military career out here in Colorado Springs. And uh, I've been chasing this, I've been chasing this uh, animal for a long time. And finally, uh, when I felt like, uh, you know, I just got tired of running and hunting, here comes a, uh, Officer Adam Mentor, walks through my door at my gym about a, about a, two weeks ago, three weeks ago, and go, hey, um, I'm Officer Mentor with the Colorado Springs Police Department. I'm the new officer for the outreach and commu community outreach programs in Colorado Springs. And I happened to bump into a guy at the coffee shop, and he told me to come by here and sit down and talk with you. So that lets you know that God works in mysterious ways. Every time we feel like we want to give up uh, or let things go, here comes what you've been looking for. As they say in the country, it might not get there when you want it, but it'd be there right on time. So we sit down and talk for almost two hours back and forth and come to find out that he was on the police department back when I first started contacting people but he had no idea the magnitude and the, the hoops that we was jumping through. They was aware of the power program, but nobody was doing anything with it. And, you know, it's funny because he come into the gym to talk to me. Then we walk out on the gym floor and go, oh, my God, man, I, I never knew this existed. And, you know, he heard of me, and, and I never heard of him. But, you know, long story short, we kind of hit it off, and now, Hopefully within the next two weeks, at least by the first of the year, I'll be sitting down with the chief of police, the people of John, as you know, we couldn't get really get a hold of when, we, when you all was out here. I'll be sitting down with the mayor. So and, and, I'm and a, the TV I'm a hold out when his water under the bridge. And the TV show guy, Go the ahead. TV show guy is going to be there too. Correct. Yes. I, I contacted him the other day through the email. Thank you for that. So what we're going to do is, the power program consists of not only just boxing, uh, combat sports. It consists of dance, art, theater, uh, soccer, baseball, almost every sport it is. But we also have uh, English lit. Um, so I have a, a variety of people in my gym now that's been, you know, been, I've been blessed with a, to be surrounded by a, peop a lot of people that has way more sense than I do. So that was a blessing. So we're pulling, we're pulling together a board here within the next, by the first of the year, and hopefully get this thing off the ground. My my vision is, you know, I'm from Alabama. I heard Sean talk about it. I'm originally from Alabama, Bibb County, Alabama, a little small, one, one two light town. But uh, I, too, was looked at as, hey, you from the country, you know, you just don't always be a country guy. But, yeah, at heart. But I was blessed through the military. I've been around the world several times. I've been places that we didn't even study about in school. So I want to give that back. And where I'm from, it still is, is a village. And and that's what I, I have the most pride of. All the places I've been, the Olympics, the world championships, working with world champs, there's nothing more prideful to have a kid come through the door of the gym and no matter where I'm at in the gym, that kid is not going to start working out till they come by and dap me up and ask me how my day was going instead of me asking them. And that's that village environment that we preach here in the gym where all the parents are going to be parents. And all, all kids. And, you know, wherever you mess up at, that's where you're going to get corrected at. And um, I, I think I turned out to be all right. You know, some of the times when you was in that village, you wish you were somewhere else when you did the wrong thing. But at, at overall, 
that's where I think we're missing our disconnect at home. Now, out in the community, it's basically communication with the police officers and, and the first lines, you know, uh, responders and stuff. It's about communication. But I was always taught charity starts at home and spread abroad. And that's what we're trying to teach you with our youth program here at the gym. Let's uh, To distill the, the thing that we had in the South when I grew up, there's one thing that you definitely didn't want to do, and that was embarrass your parents' name. And our kids don't understand that in today's society. So we can police up our kids, and then everybody can police up each other. You know, I think it's time out for both sides being the victim when it comes to uh, police officers and just regular civilians. Everybody wants to be the victim. The police officer doesn't want to do anything because we people looking down their nose at them, as they say in the South. And, and the kids and the, and the parents don't want to do anything because the stereotypes that they see and, and see on the police officer. We got a great United States. If that, was, if that wasn't true, then we wouldn't be free. We'd be up on a dictatorship. That's, that's what I honestly believe. We got a great, I served 22 years and I've met some people in my 22 years that will forever be an etch in my heart and in my mind because I learned something everywhere I went. You know, I learned something. And if we can give up the pride thing and the he said, she said, and the finger point and come together because where there's unity, there's strength. One of the oldest, oldest sins in the world. Together we stand, divided we fall. And I honestly believe that. So with these kids here in this power program, I'm hoping, John, that by the time you get back out here in the spring, or the summer, whenever y'all decide to come by, it'll be so many people and so many hands and so many things going in different directions versus what we was doing, which we had a good setup last time. I, I want to blow it out the water. No, no, I mean, I we, blow it out the we're going to be there in June. And uh, okay, we're, so, we're, we're excited. You know, we, we, we started something a little bit there in July, and uh, we got the TV station and some local vets, and, you know, we're building it up. And... Uh, that's, that's what we want to do in all the communities that we work with. And that's why with these town halls, we bring together people like Harriet in Seattle and Don in Minneapolis and Sean in Chicago and our next guest, Susan in New Orleans. And, and it's just, uh, we got, you know, everybody's from somewhere. Um, Alexis is in North Carolina and we, we can come together and, and make a plan and hit all these different communities. And, uh, you know, it's, it's both and, you know, we're going to, we're going to help the cops and we're going to help the communities. We're going to work together and we're going to make a difference. Well, again, um, I, I, it's an honor to be a part of this. And, uh, you know, I'm just tickled to death. You know, I, I, I really am. I'm tickled to death to where we're at now and where this is going. And, you know, the overall scope of, of what we're trying to get out of this. And I know, I'm hands on. Let me put it that way. So if anybody ever on this end of town of Colorado Springs, you know, we I'm from the south, so I think I can cook anything. So I make a mean brisket. I'll make a mean pulled pork. So I got it all. It was good. But, um, Coach. Yeah. It was good. So if you're ever out in Colorado Springs area, hit me up. Uh, my house is your house. My car is your car. You don't have to worry about anything. Just show up. And uh, again, I got to go train these kiddos. They starting to line up at the door now. But um, uh, it's an honor to to be a part of this group. And um, I carry that with me every day. And I really appreciate you. Yeah, make sure you say hi to Jamel. Charles. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Coach. Yep. Hey, guys. Thanks, Charles. Charles. Yes, sir. I want to take you up on that one, by the way, especially the brisket side. Yeah, oh, Fa Fa Fowdy when, never. Whenever you're out you here, you can't see Fowdy because he's in the dark. But Fowdy never met a meal he didn't enjoy. <laughs> <laughs> well, I definitely um, that'll be on our menu come June for sure. The weather be done broke good, so we'll we that first meal will be on me as always. So we'll we'll have our our brisket and smoked macaroni and cheese oh, and maybe. Guy. 
for that mac and cheese. I don't even eat mac. Yeah. And I went back for seconds. So. <laughs> hey, coach. So, uh, so ser- most definitely. seriously, before yes, you sir. go, uh, we're gonna hook up uh, you and I and Alexis, and then uh, probably Mike and a few other of the athletes, and uh, we're gonna talk okay. talk, talk a, a strategy, and I, we're gonna invite Don because we can incorporate his idea into that, and I think there's some some really good stuff there. And uh, always good talking with you. I mean, we talk all the time anyway. So I, I don't know if you're still yeah. there, Alexis, because you got your camera off, but uh, we're going to get on that. All right. I look forward to it. You all have a great rest of the day, and we got a little snow out here in Colorado Springs, so. I don't know. I'm no pretty sure, John. I ain't never saw you with a jacket on. So I know <laughs> it's good weather out there. Where you at? I don't even know if you even own a jacket or a car. Yeah. Can you drive, John? Do you have a drive license? You just ride your bike everywhere. No, I got it. I got a car. <laughs> okay. okay. He I'll drives be... his car like he rides his bike. <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> well, as he say, after as they, as my grandma used to say, he's hell on wheels. <laughs> I'm a bot. All right, you all have a great rest of the day. Thank you, Coach. Bye, Coach. Yeah. All right, uh, appreciate it. Sorry, uh, I uh, wanted to make sure we got him in there because he is a treasure, that man. Um, our, our last guest is uh, someone that most of you that are around have, are familiar with. She's been involved with us uh, since the beginning. Uh, it was one of the first connections I made. Uh, Susan Hudson from the National Association for Civilian Oversight for Law Enforcement. Um, I think, Sean, you might know her or know of her, and Don, you definitely need to get to know her, and so does Harriet, although Harriet had to leave us for a while, but uh, Susan, uh, take it away. Hey, John. Um, thank you for having me. Good evening to you all. Well, it's evening here in New Orleans. I guess it's still a little late afternoon there in California. Um, but glad to be here and excited to see these WNBA stars on here. I do have to start off talking about that because it was a long time ago, but I used to I used to loop a little Can bit. So uh, so I'm definitely a big, I'm a big <laughs> WNBA fan, and I was um, and I was there for all of the Houston Comets first championships because I lived in Houston at the time when the WNBA just got started. So I'm a big fan, um, and so glad to meet meet the, the players. Um, I'm a lawyer by trade. Um, I'm a former defense attorney, former prosecutor. I was a former assistant city attorney, and now I got police oversight or accountability for police departments um, is what I do now. And I've done that for the last ooh, 16 years. So um, I was at an Austin police department and then the Los Angeles police department and now in New Orleans. And um, I, when I I've, so I've seen policing from a number of different perspectives, um, and I like where I'm at right now because especially in this time after May 25th, uh, you know, our country is just going through so much change, um, change that I would argue is for the better. Um, as we can see, there's a whole lot of people to whom our criminal justice system was unfair. Um, it has all the isms in it. Um, and there was a lot of changes that need to be made. It was created to really control a number of people. Um, and so the more you read about that, I think the better. I think Sean talked talked about the, the uh, books he had been reading. I think it's uh, huge. We're learning a lot during this time of change about the history of some of our systems, but especially our criminal justice system. Um, so you can read a lot about it. There's the new Jim Crow, there's White Fragility, there's the books How to Be Anti-Racist and a number of other ones that others have talked about. But it's really important that police understand where policing came from and where some of the things that they do came from. Super important. Um, and so we're working on that right now. Um, in police oversight, we are charged with holding police departments accountable and making sure that they're holding themselves accountable but we're also charged with building trust between uh, the community that we all serve and their police department. And a number of the people who reach out to us are not just people who say, oh, I got framed or I got roughed up or wrongfully arrested, but victims of crimes, victims and survivors of crime come to us a lot. And they come to us and say, we need help. We did not get the policing services that we need. So um, 
we kind of stand in the gap of police oversight is in, in if there's any gap in between police and community we are a part of our community um if there's any gap there it's our job to kind of jump into that gap and kind of build some bridges and bring the two together so we deal we help um whomever not only that we help officers who have been um mistreated and they they can file complaints with our office and we look out for them to make sure that they are not retaliated against so we don't care to whom the system is unfair we want to do something about that we want it to operate in an appropriate manner um so we work we're working on that and then we're very much about transparency what we are finding out right now after may 25th is we don't even know the number for sure of people who've been killed by the police around the country there were no statistics kept officially by that by a federal government. We don't know um, officially how much force is used or violence is used by police on a regular basis. So um, one of the things we have to do if we are going to do something about the issues that we see is we've got to be transparent. We have to keep data and we have to share that with our community um, so that you can make decisions about how you want your police department to operate. And we are all about community led policing. So we want, I, I tell folks, um, people have talked about uh, defund and abolition. I always say I'm a wannabe abolitionist. Um, as somebody put in the chat, um, we all want utopia, but that's still an undiscovered, undiscovered country right now. Um, we all want to be there at that point where we don't need policing, but we have a whole long way to go. But as others have talked about, one of the things we're working on is making sure that we can lessen policing's footprint it is such a big part of all of our lives we'd like it to be more in proportion to where it needs to be which is dealing with violent crime dealing with people that make us all unsafe dealing with people that hurt others um but as others have mentioned police have just been thrown into the mix for everything Do we really need to spend highly paid cops to deal with shoplifters can't businesses just have more security um, let's don't police children. They need something that's different and they can be saved if we do the right things by them. Uh, and that includes parenting as well as the systems that they come in contact with. And then others mentioned dealing with the mentally ill. Uh, we work on projects like that to make sure that we have a better response than just policing and a better place to take people than just jails so that um, they're getting the help that they need. Before people spiral out of control to the point that they've actually committed a crime, those with mental illness, um, there have been warning signs all along the way in which they could have been responded to by some type of practitioner who could have helped them either get back on their meds or get to therapy or do something before we get to that point that they end up in jail or in prison. So um, we're all about community-led solutions um, and working with uh, our uh, the police our community, uh, other experts to try and do better and make our criminal justice system so much better for all of us. Um, and so that's police oversight in a nutshell. That's awesome. And um, just so you know, Sean, um, I think I mentioned to you when we spoke on the phone that um, when Tarek came on our town hall and met Susan, that led to uh, the implementation of civilian oversight for the Arlington Police Department that's ongoing right now. And that, that was one of our big wins from, from our town hall series. And so um, just wanted to make sure, Sean, you, I connected you to that because I know you and Tark talk. Yeah, he, he did mention that, thank you. And um, so um, unfortunately, Alexis just dropped off. Um, I wanted to uh, address the question that Brian asked, but we'll, we'll jump to some other things. First, Sean, um, in uh, 2016, we led a uh, veterans group from Atlanta to New Orleans, and we did the Selma March, on, but on bicycles, because you know we're broken down old people. Um, but uh, it was quite an experience, and uh, you know, uh, we, we actually started in Montgomery and finished at the uh, Pettus Bridge in Selma and went to the museums along the way. And um, next year, I believe is the 55th anniversary of the Selma March. And we, we would like to try to do something with this group as a voice project event. And we're trying to figure out what we can do. But um, I think it would be good for, for a, as a way to um, bring attention to the, to the both and proposition. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I mean, I, I definitely recommend if, if you can, and you know, it's definitely if you don't walk, it it, it requires a little bit of conditioning. <laughs> I will tell you, there were some days we we kind of limped back into the hotel to rest for the night, but um, you know, it's definitely a, a wonderful experience. Um, I will say, if, if you get a chance to do it, try to give something back to the community before you leave. Um, you know, I, we got stopped by a citizen who was like, you know, everyone comes here, they want to know about stuff, and then they leave, and then, and then nothing ever changes. And our community is left the way it is. They, uh, some people were upset that they did the movie there, and, and there was no real economic impact that this person could see. Not that it wasn't, but that this person could see. So by the time we got to Montgomery, we turned the corner on a Sunday and there was a church. We popped our head in there and, and, and sat through a couple of songs and, and whatnot and, and they prayed for us and then we left and then we researched that church later and we sent them a donation. So um, I would say if you do do that, try to leave something uh, uh, in the community because they certainly certainly could, could use it. No, we'll, we'll, we'll make a plan and uh, something I'm definitely interested in. And then I also wanted to... Um, um, bring in uh, Joe from the LAPD to to react to the stuff that Don had talked about and the stuff that you had talked about. So go ahead, Joe. We can't hear you. You're you're, you're doing your China, uh, Japanese monster movie impersonation. Hello again. Check one two. Yeah. Can you hear me? Okay, um, again, uh, thank you for uh, um, inviting me again and uh, being part of this. Um, you know, it's really uh, amazing to hear everybody's um, uh, input and um, story and their role in their community. It's, uh, you know, it's definitely, I do believe the, the real police is the community uh, concept. And, um, you know, I, I say that almost, you know, to myself and to other people almost every other day because uh, it's, it's, it's something I truly believe in. And, you know, when other officers see me work out in the community, you know, and it, it's something that hopefully is passed on, you know, um, not verbally. But um, I work for uh, uh, the Chiefs Community Relations Team, and um, I've been here uh, once before. And uh, my other teammates uh, have jumped in it too. And um, just... Uh, you know, hearing everybody's uh, input and insight. Um, you know, for LAPD, we're all about police reform, and um, you know, our our policies with it within LAPD and our, our accountability is 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 pretty high. Um, and you know, we can't we can't forget the mistakes that we've made, and we have to learn from it. And um, definitely, big good listeners. Uh, uh, and that's what we've learned from, um, you know, during this time of uh, social injustice. And it's it's something that, um, you know, the word reconciliation, um, hopefully uh, we could hold on to that. And and that's what drives me uh, to, to build that bridge again within the community and for the community to trust us. Um, you know, it's it, it's very hard to see other counterparts with uh, their morale down and try to keep positivity. To be honest, um, it's uh, you know, like for me, it's it's uh, uh, definitely a driving force uh, to stay positive. Um, you know, because I I mean, if I let the negativity overcome me, you know, I pass it on to my fellow officers and I bring it home. Um, so uh, that's um, being here in this town hall actually uh, refuels uh, my motivation to you know work even harder. So uh, thank you to everybody. Yeah, thank you. And you know we're working. Uh, we did host a live town hall with Chief Moore and Sheriff Villanueva with the Dodgers. And um, it's interesting, Sean, that you mentioned that book about housing because one of the pastors that was uh, one of the community panelists brought up housing and how um, housing was used to systematically 
um, disadvantaged certain communities. And um, we didn't talk a lot about it, but it, it definitely came up as a topic in the, in the town hall. Yes, I mean, those uh, housing projects, and uh, I'm glad we're, we're uh, um, revamping our community safety partnership as a bureau to uh, uh, give more attention to our developments and housing projects. Um, you know, that's where crime is done behind doors and it's really hard to see. So we need, you know, that community's input and, and our extra eyes and ears to keep their community safe. Um, so building that relationship with community members is essential, along with any other community in Los Angeles. Yeah, for sure. And I think that, uh, um, you know, things like what Dawn is doing, simple things that create goodwill go a long way. And, um, you know, now, now we're, I'm supposed to get back with Nicole at the Dodgers um, later this week, and I'm going to bring that opportunity up because maybe it's, there's a, you know, because you can, in, here in LA, you can get, you know, Jiffy Lube sponsorships or something like that where you can, can do something that can um, elevate that program. And we lost Alexis. I think she had to go to a, another meeting, but there, it's that sort of thing with the sports thing. And then what Susan and Sean are trying to do with creating oversight so that the real, the term community policing actually is community policing. And like we did the, we've done two scenarios. One was the shepherd and the flock, which some of you may remember, um, you know, is, is the police department the shepherd or are they the wolf? And, you know, the, you know, everyone, we need to try to get everyone on the same page or we're like we did in LA a couple of weeks ago where it was the glass half full class glass half empty and, and the disconnect between the community and, and other people as far as what, what that was like. So um, I'm excited about, you know, we're, we're building out our coalition with different people throughout the country in cities that are being challenged as equally as LA. Certainly Minneapolis and Seattle are two of the big examples that we've seen, you know, kind of started in Minneapolis and how can we, you know, do things to improve because defund the police is not a winning strategy. It, it, it hurts the people that you're supposed to be protecting the most vulnerable, the most disadvantaged, the most at risk. Yes, definitely. So our, our, our crime is kind of skyrocketing right now, especially with the homicides being over 300 and it's been the highest in quite some years. Um, and, uh, coming into next year, uh, with attrition and retirement and um, our hiring will will definitely ex, um, ex really slow down. Uh, our academy classes will be, uh, I'm not sure if it's going to be every 28 days uh, the way it is now. Uh, it's going to be skipping quite a few months instead of uh, every 28 days. So uh, that's going to cause a chain reaction of uh, police officers out on the street and police uh, uh, being there for the community. Um, as for the 150 million that was uh, reallocated from our budget, um, hopefully the community members get on top of the council people and figure out and make sure that money is being utilized uh, to help the community and not just let it be a slush fund. So, um, you know, we're we're hopeful for the, all the citizen uh, uh, reallocated uh, resources that are going to be implemented. And, you know, it's something that we just have to work with and make it work. Uh, and hopefully uh, safety is uh, uh, utmost importance uh, with those uh, civilian response teams. So two, two questions. One is directly to you and one's directed to the group. Um, Don had mentioned that carjackings were up substantially in Minneapolis. And I saw on the news, I think it was last night on the local news that carjackings are up like 330% in LA. What, what is it about carjackings that all of a sudden that's like something you hear about like all the time now? Do you guys, uh, either Don or, or Joe, do you guys have any insight on the carjacking thing? What's that about? Um, for, for LA, I would, I would assume being, uh, 
not being aware of your surroundings, um, driving with your one hand and holding a phone with the other. I mean, you have, you know, you're trying to pay attention to the road and you're looking at your Instagram. Um, it's pretty easy pickings if someone's holding their phone and trying to, um, you know, just scroll on their social media. So it's, it's, uh, it's a little bit of both. And, um, and uh, everybody's in their car uh, driving around and trying to social distance and going through drive through So um, it's, it's less walking and more in their vehicle, I believe. And then, and then uh, I don't know, Don, if you have anything to say, if you have any insight from your. Yeah, well, you know, just the age of the, high, uh, the carjackers is interesting. So it's, it has something to do with uh, the opportunity that comes down in age. Um, you know, the, the kids are able to approach people without uh, distrust um, because they're so young. And um, so the usual guardedness that you would have if five young men at 20 age, four years old start to walk towards you, the kids don't have that. So they're able to go up to people and engage them and then just attack them. And um, and then, you know, with the COVID issue and kids at home all alone or, or at only at home, I think that might have something to do with the, the way they're communicating with each other and kind of bored and plotting and planning. That might have something to do with it. And, um, and of course, um, the, the, uh, the, the downward trending of crime as younger and younger kids get involved in in those in those kinds of things from families that are very young and very uh, dysfunctional and um, not having the tools to um, to help those kids even make it past puberty almost anymore. And that is a big concern about parenting and parent support systems. Yeah, we have the uh, Bob and. Uh... Daryl from the ROTC LA Unified programmer are on. And we, we normally have a lot of high school kids be part of the town hall. Today, unfortunately, we don't because they have finals this week, so they couldn't come on. But I don't know, Daryl and, and Bob, if you guys have anything you want to add to what, to what Don is saying about the kids. Um. Well, this is Bob. I'd like to say, you know, what you guys are doing is kind of helping me and I think Colonel Hensley formulate a plan because I think when COVID's over and the, you know, I taught at Jordan High School in South LA and uh, the LA Jordan and Southgate and uh, and yeah, I, I live in Orange County, so I see the disparity and I think coming out of this COVID um kids are going to have to reacclimate and uh try to get jobs and get back into college and working with other students and it's going to be tough because they come from tough neighborhoods there's definitely inequity in the schools and uh you know i believe the military veterans along with us down at the school the instructors you know are going to be great they're a great opportunity to mentor and help kids stay on the right direction and and i think that involves the police department, it will involve us down at the schools. And we know a lot of us being prior military, what kind of leadership and mentorship we could provide to young uh, men and women and keep them on the right path. So hopefully they don't have problems after high school and they can get into colleges and get good jobs. But I definitely think there's, once we get through this thing, the economic aftermath and the educational uh, difficulties the students have had over this past year you know are going to manifest themselves in probably negative ways and and groups like this might have the possibility to you know engage with students and prevent bad things from happening and uh, that's what we're here to do to try to give them hope and uh, an opportunity and structure and build confidence so they can be successful in a very tough environment and i taught rotc at usc and I, and I ran the program at Dominguez Hills. And if anybody's from LA, you know, there's a different environment there and you have to treat a student from Dominguez Hills different from, from one at USC. And I think down at the high schools, there's a lot of opportunity to, 
help kids. And, they, and I could tell from being an instructor at, at Jordan for a short time that once you get in there and you show them you care, even if you're an adult figure and a white old guy, they, they'll embrace you because they want to get out of that dilemma and they want to get out of that poverty and they're looking for someone to help them um, you know, reach the American dream. So I dig what you guys are doing and I'm here to support in any way I can. Uh, it's good. One more point, if I may. Sure. Um, sure. Yeah. So, um, you know, this is way, way upstream, but uh, my wife and I have been working at this for 23 years that we've been married. We live in the most violent community and we want, we moved here to give back. So we, we jumped in and she now runs the Northside Achievement Zone, which is a, a modeled after Jeffrey Canada's Harlem Children's Zone. And um, but we, we also realized the need for the, of the community to have um, to, to knowledge, parenting knowledge. And, and um, that seems to be an inaccessible kind of a bubble that people occupy in their homes. How do you pierce that and, and get in there and provide some help? And so the, one of the things we came up with was a, a radio show every Sunday morning. It's called Power to the Parents. And we, we are on Facebook Live, and, uh, and we also um, are on the radio at 11 o'clock on Sunday mornings. And we, we talk about brain science, and we bring it down to the level of um, the, the regular single mom or young parents uh, in the community and telling them about how uh, in the first 1,000 days, your child acquires 80% of its um, capacity. And so how important that is and that it's scientific and that it's proven and that if you hug your kid, sing to your kid, talk to your kid regularly, be warm rather than punitive and, um, and use words and, uh, and, and demonstrate um, caring and so on, that you can create, um, as Frederick Douglass said, it's easier to uh, make strong, to, to build, strong ch children than to uh, repair broken men and so if if we begin at age zero to three you know the the youngest mom you don't have to go out buy expensive toys you don't have to have anything expensive it's you and your child connecting relating being present with your child all of that information is stuff that's been in the universities and now we think it belongs in the street and we need to fight to get it to parents especially young parents who move from city to city, uh, lose their three levels of, um, of generational support. They're on their own, uh, their friends or their party friends, and, and they have no source of knowledge. They're not going to church, they don't belong to any clubs. It's, um, it's party and parent. And so, um, you know, we have to pierce that bubble of isolation and get information to young parents when uh, the, when the help really matters. Yeah, I know, I know as a parent, my son, when he was, you know, very young, he was more interested in the box than the present that was in the box. Right. <laughs> it's the simplest right. things in yeah. life. Uh, I also want to bring in, you know, yeah. we've been talking a lot about Selma and Alabama, and uh, we have on the line Clyde Jones, uh, pastor connected with the Macedonia Baptist Church in Daphne, Alabama. I guess Pastor Jackson couldn't make it today, but... Uh, I see Clyde's there, um, and uh, you know we did a live town hall with Clyde and Pastor Jackson um, back in September that was really effective, and we were dealing with um, racism and the Confederate symbols, and so I just wanted to give him an opportunity because he represents the faith community, which I think is an important part of the Voice Project and, and brings uh, some good things to the table. Hey, hello everyone. Uh, it's good to be with you all and uh, some great conversation, some great dialogue. Um, sorry, General Casey had to leave. I, I served with him uh, in Iraq and a few other places. So, uh, of course, we didn't meet, but I just wanted to say hello. But uh, all the comments that we, we've heard, I mean, and some of the things about, you know, our history and, and particularly visiting the different areas here in Alabama, I mean, they're very important. Uh, we. Uh, we actually take people on pilgrimage is what we call it when we go to those legacy museums and the lynching memorial and, and we take very diverse groups to those places and then we 
we have some questions that we, we talk about on the way up there. Then we let people just look. Uh, it's very emotional. You know, a lot of people uh, are in tears. And I heard a gentleman say earlier how emotional it was marching into uh, uh, Montgomery. But it's very emotional when we take those people in those so, groups. So, uh, sorry, uh, on sorry, sorry, no. are, so are you volunteering to work with Renata to help us plan a, uh, a civil rights uh, um, tour? Sure. You got that, sure, you got sure. that you Renata? You got your camera off. With, with, Definitely help with that. Uh, like I said, we uh, uh, we always and, and it's very educational, and and then we we get together and uh, uh, we normally go to a church afterwards after we've toured the museum or a memorial, and, and we just have a discussion about you know how how did uh, how did it affect you? I mean, you know, what did you think about what you saw? And and we all have different perspectives, right? We all have different backgrounds. We all grew up in different areas and we and we see things and perceive things differently so it's always a uh, a good experience a great experience and a growing experience when we get together and do those things but i absolutely help with anything that uh that we can put together some tours uh for the group uh when you all come out we were my wife and i were at the 50th uh anniversary for a, a commemoration of uh of the march uh in selma and the edmund pettis bridge and and uh it was a great uh event and there were so many people so we definitely would love to go back uh, for the 55th we, we don't live that far away from there so uh it's just with COVID, we haven't <clears throat> we haven't been lately we actually had a uh a tour scheduled for a uh, plantation in uh, louisiana as well that uh really is very historic uh, uh i can't turn up place to go so, so uh yeah I'm just glad to be here again, and, uh, and 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 you know me representing the faith community. Uh, you know it all goes back to as we treat each other, uh, as we would like to be treated. It kind of goes back to that faith community. So it's important that we that we uh, you know look inside and look uh, to to whoever or whatever guides us to to make sure we are better and a better country. So thank you again, John, for inviting me. I really enjoyed listening in, and uh, you all have a great evening. Yeah, we're going to – originally we had looked at trying to do it in March, which is when we did it in 2016. But with the COVID situation, um, we may wait now that they're rolling out the vaccine and see how that goes. And, and maybe we're looking at a uh, an early fall or, or you know, October-ish, late September time frame perhaps where things might be a little more doable. Cause we also have, in addition to the 55th anniversary for Selma, it's also the 20th anniversary of 9-11, which, which is a big anniversary for our group of, of veterans and first responders. So we, we have something planned for the 20th anniversary of 9-11. So it, it could be a big, big year in 2021. We, we need something fun and good after, after this last year. Oh, absolutely, absolutely, and and the fall time would be great, yeah, for for that for sure. So, so there's a question that came up, and we've kind of touched a little bit about it, but I want to bring it up and throw it open to Sean, and uh, Don, and um, Susan, and and that is COVID and isolation, and what role does that play in rising tensions in the community? Because you have, like in LA now, we have all these protests going on because of. Uh, um the restrictions on dining and and different things like that even though the there's a dispute on data but certainly it creates stress between law enforcement and the community at a time where there's already the highest stress so i just want to do a little quick round robin with that and uh start with you sean so um I think the first comment I will make um, is that of a researcher, unfortunately, a um, bit of, a, of an egghead. So correlation and causation are two totally different things. I think that because two things may be moving in the same direction, we tend to think that they are related, but they may not be. Um, we have seen rising crime throughout the country, particularly violent crime and certainly carjackings in Chicago are, are at an unprecedented uh, rate and I hear that it's the same thing. So I don't know if if I would if I'm ready to say that COVID is causing the crime to go up. 
But what I am saying is that I've noticed that during the pandemic, uh, people still express their First Amendment right. And I think the, the bigger observation to me was that despite having this pandemic, this virus that has taken so many people away from us, people still felt compelled to come out and speak for the type of community and type of service that they wanted. Um, you know, in relation to crime, I, I cannot, I don't know, I don't know if it's causing it, but what I can tell you that speaking to officers and people that, that I know, um, there is some stress involved with it. Um, there, I do know several police officers personally who passed away uh, due to this pandemic. And it's something that I think police officers think about. They're a little perplexed that they don't get credit for still serving and going into homes and finding lost children and doing the things that they need to do in the middle of a pandemic and not getting any credit for it. And, and, and that does cause a little bit of, of, of anxiety and stress. Maybe credit is a bad, poor choice of words, but some consideration for policing in, in a pandemic. Um, similar to, you know, nurses have to do their thing, EMS workers have to do their thing and still kind of be protected. You're, you're not invincible simply because you have on a badge. You're still susceptible to any and everything that the general public is. And you, the only difference is after 12 hours, you have to go home. You know, I know police officers who are changing in their garage, changing in their garage and going up to, the, to their bedroom to take a shower before they kiss their children because of this pandemic. So that's something that, that we certainly cannot forget that people may be going through at this time. Yeah, I mean, before before yeah. uh, May 25th, you know, signs were popping up everywhere, you know, thanks to our first responders. We thank our first responders. And there was an outpouring of support for law enforcement. And then by May 26th, it was evaporated. Go ahead, Joe. You were going to say something? I think you're still on mute. Oh, no, go ahead. No, so, so I was going to throw that op open to Don and, and, you know, what, how does COVID and the uh, business closures, I, I see Arlene's got her hand up. She's a, she's one of our army medics and she's on the front lines on COVID. So go ahead, Arlene. Yeah, I just wanted for law enforcement, I wanted to find out because our law enforcement are working extra hours. They're not, I know my nephew in New York, he was working mandatory extra shifts with the riots and the COVID. Um, what are we doing to take care of our law enforcement? And this goes to our law enforcement. Um, as for LAPD, um, you know, we we have had some internal talks with within, you know, uh, command staff and police officers and our uh, BSS, our behavioral sciences and uh, and and our um, psychologists. Um, but it's 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 one of those things where it takes the officer. It takes it's up to the officer to actually um, ask for help. And um, these uh, psychologists are provided free and it's anonymous for any LAPD employee and their families, um, you know, their wives or partners or husbands or, uh, you know, even their kids. I mean, um, any family member extended or not um, are available to talk to a psychologist uh, for whatever issue or problem uh, they may have. Um, right now, it's, it's really hard for... Um, you know, for some um, people working in any type of industry that's in turmoil, whether they're, uh, you know, on the brink of being laid off. But, you know, for us, um, you know, it's it's really hard um, not to take things personal uh, and, and take those uh, really, uh, those words that, you know, um, you know, we should be abolished or defunded and, uh, you know, 
we're not needed anymore. It, it's really hard to ignore those words, but you know, we kind of have to do our job and, um, and move forward and still uh, provide service to our communities. Um, but it's, you know, it does affect the home greatly. I mean, you know, speaking for myself, um, you know, just, uh, I, I, you know, I just, my wife just tells me like how I um, stay positive so, so much where, you know, all I see and all she sees on social media and friends and losing friends because I'm a police officer, even though they know me personally and what I do for the community, they still disregard um, you know, being part of their life. So I've had friends uh, cut me off. So, you know, trying to deal with that stuff is, is, is hard. Can I offer you a challenge? Can you see if you can get one officer to come to each of our events to go cycling? Because I promise you it would be a benefit to them. <laughs> where, where do you guys cycle? Well, we have a... Uh... Our first event for 2021 is going to be in Las Vegas, and it's February 16th through the 21st. And as part of that, we're hoping to have a live in-person town hall partnering with the Raiders. And I would like to have all of you guys come out or participate in that. Um, it'll be, you know, hopefully the biggest town hall we've ever had, and we can use that town hall to sort of kick off our 2021 plan of action and I want to I want to spend the next few weeks you know sort of creating a little bit of some committees where we can take some of the um, particular issues we want to do and and take some of these key people so like civilian oversight you know guys like Sean and Susan and 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 some of those and then how how do we work and, and maybe we'll just do it on the town hall where we just come up and we'll have a topic each day and we'll just invite sort of what we'll call the uh, the inner circle and, and kind of brainstorm anybody who wants to contribute ideas to how we can do this. And, and also I think General Casey's gone, but one of the goals is if you remember um, and, if you, and if you didn't see it, you can watch the comment that Dave Roberts made at the, at the end of the town hall. Um, and uh, and how uh, um, someone's the uh, perception is reality. Well, no, we we when yeah, well, not that comment, but um, in particular, he said his first comment was, "This is gold, and we need to take this and we need to put it into schools, yes. and we need to you know show kids uh, how real conversations are conducted and how the proper way." And we're working right now with Rise to create some content videos that can be shown in schools through our YouTube channel that can be shown in any school in America. So that's one of the initiatives that we want to put together. And then the other, the other thing was, you know, we, we don't talk about defund the police. We don't talk about police reform. We talk about better police and how can we have better police and because people, I, I was talking to Alexis earlier today, we were talking about the buzzword of the day is police accountability, but no one defines what that means. And so, you know, we as, as a veterans organization have, have put together what, what we think police accountability looks like and, you know, taking input from Susan and Tarek and, and David and all the people that are here, you know, and what does, how does that relate to the uniform code of military justice that veterans adhere to? And how you can have a national standard and, and have that be sort of the police have to like the one comment that Dave Roberts did make was police have they have the authority, they have the guns, they have to be the first ones to be the leaders and take charge and not be defensive, but be proactive. And you and I talked about that um, on one of the town halls about, you know, don't be defensive. Let's let's take the lead and say, hey, as we have enough police chiefs in this organization and you know with david's help we can we can bring in a, a bunch more we got you know we got la we got the sheriffs we got texas we got chicago we got new york we got new jersey you know we can we can build out and, and put something together that that can be actually productive instead of destructive 
No, yes, uh, um, you know, that that uh, that group ride in uh, Vegas, I, I, I would totally be part of it and, and you know, any anything that could help. Um, it's just uh, my my mother is coming from the Philippines and I have to do this whole quarantine dance and making sure she's safe and my family's safe. And that's at the end of February, mid-February. So, man, the timing on that is... So just get one of your guys. Well, you know, you know who you know who rides what? bikes. I, I've actually ridden bikes with him. Is Chief Moore? He, yeah. Oh. oh, there you go. He cycles. Um, and uh, you know, Mike Haynes and I are going to be yeah. on with the Raiders tomorrow, and we'll report back to you guys what we find out. But the idea is that the Ve Vegas gives us an opportunity, and also the Wounded Blue and and some of the other organizations that we work with. We you know also we we do the brain scans on on the participants so anyone that participates in our event you get a free brain scan that you can use to uh, you know look at your health that you know that's that's part of the therapy part of life aid um so you know wh what i want to try to do is is try to put together some some you know an action plan and then you know use that uh, hopefully the raider event that we'll do it's tentatively you know depending on what the raiders say tomorrow but my hope is is that we can do it on that Friday, which would be, I believe, February nineteenth. Is there a flyer for this? Uh, Renata will send you the information. We we don't we don't do flyers per se. This is twenty. This is twenty twenty. We use electronics. <laughs> so, I mean, I'm sorry, PDF. <laughs> well, we we we'll send you the information. We have a we have electronic flyers. We don't. Uh, Susan, thank you for being on. Uh, she's already gone. But um, I think there's so much good momentum that we've generated. You know, we started these town halls back in March. And, you know, obviously after May 25th, they took on a different tone. Um, but there's, they've been incredibly productive and, and a lot of great ideas. And we're bringing in more great people like Don and Harriet and Alexis and Sean um, to the table. And, and you can see that, you know, collectively, there's some really good ideas that, you know, obviously the media is not going to portray that, but we can, we can, by getting the, the sports and the vets gives us a platform to, to, to send a different message. And my, my PR people were on, but I think they, we lost them. I'm not sure. Yeah, they're gone. But uh, we're already past. We're 15 minutes past our normal time. <laughs> but that's how good these things are. I mean, it's just that good. I don't know if anybody wants to have uh, Don. If you have any parting comments or you know what you thought of this town hall, and hopefully you want to continue being part of this group. Uh oh. Thinking. Yeah, it's um, it's a it's a great uh, opportunity to connect. You know, it's all about connections. It's all about um, sharing ideas and um, continuously improving. And by hearing what somebody else is doing, that's a little bit different or better than what you're doing. It's the opposite of isolation, right? Which is what's happening with COVID and these teenage kids. They get isolated. They're not talking to anybody. They're sitting at home alone. They're bored and, and their worst selves come out, right? So but the, the opposite is engagement. If they were going to school every day, and engaging with teachers and each other, they would they would be busy, they would be occupied, and the, the devil does, wouldn't find work for idle hands. So, um, it, it, it no matter what age you are, uh, you're a kid, teenager with COVID, or you're a cop. If you're isolated, you get stuck. You can't grow. If, if we have these kinds of interaction across different disciplines and across different regions, we get better. It just works that way. And so I appreciate sharing this time with you and hearing what other people are doing across the country. And it just gives a little thing here, a little thing there to nudge you out of your comfort zone and improving yourself. So I appreciate Thanks. it. Hey, Mike Haynes, you got anything you, you, you want to add? No, you're good. Uh, Sean, any, any last comments, Sean? Uh, yeah, my one last comment. Um, you have my information 
And if you need to publish that with the group, I would certainly like to uh, stay in contact. And um, I, I really mean it when I say if I can ever do anything for anyone, please let me know. And um, I'm only where I am today because of people like on this call, mentorship, and listening to folks that are much smarter than me. So if, um, if you need me, please call me, and um, hopefully I can do the same thing if I ever need your expertise. And uh, and and uh, thank you, uh, Sean, for um, mentioning that. Please contact me about the Lights On program if you're interested, and um, I would love to send you a packet that we send out to different uh, departments, and um, you can look it over and see how incredible. No, we're going to do something with that, Don. Don't you worry. I got I got, yeah. I got some ideas. Uh, David, do uh, uh, you want to say anything? Uh, thanks, John. I, you know, can I just do a little public shout out of thanks to Sean Barnes because um, uh, we, uh, he, he helped us a lot in some of our work that we've done with the U.S. Department of Justice and the, and the COPS office for just creating brand new training programs for law enforcement. Um, he's been a subject matter expert that's been extremely helpful. Uh, for us and and uh, and the Department of Justice. So thanks, Sean, and it was great to be on the call today. Thank you, everybody. No, I appreciate you being on, Dave, and I, I'm hoping that you're going to get me those other other connections that we had discussed because I I'm, I want to build this coalition um, even bigger. And anybody else have a parting comment because we're we're way over time, but uh, obviously uh, no one minded because you're still all here. Joe, you got anything? Um, you know what? Uh, I just wanted to say uh, cycling and getting back into mountain biking um, and starting off my five-year-old on mountain biking has been a savior and some uh, giving me some mental health as, long, as well as she has, uh, you know, riding with other kids with masks. Um, you know, uh, it's, you know, I just hope some, some people find some sort of outlet uh, that's outdoors, hiking or in, in other uh, forms of outdoor activity, uh, you know, uh, some have been resistant to it, like my wife, uh, <laughs> but, but, um, you know, just, uh, keep on pushing and, uh, keep on trying to stay healthy and, uh, stay what, what are you doing Thursday morning? Thank you. Thursday morning, I'll be here at work on a couple of zoom oh, meetings. Well, you might have, you might have to cancel <laughs> one of those zoom meetings and come meet us in, uh, Willand Hills. Well, uh, um, I might have uh, some sort of training ride that I have to implement since our gyms are closed. <laughs> it's, a, it's a consulting meeting. We'll have a consulting meeting. Yes. <laughs> I, think, I think we can make that happen. <laughs> we're, 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 we're meeting up at 9 o'clock in Woodland Hills. Right, Renata? Uh, I do have a roof rack. <laughs> yeah, there's going to be a group of us and we're going to have a a, a group yeah. meeting. We're we're gonna have a board. I, as I used to call it, we're gonna have a board meeting. Yeah. <laughs> well, pick you up on the way. <laughs> How many miles? Well, whatever we end up doing, it's it's more about the uh, camaraderie than it is about the miles. Yeah. Okay. Great. 